Hi, everybody. Hi, colleagues. Uh, I introduce myself. I am Professor Samir Hamama from France. I am Professor of Reproductive Medicine of University Hospital of Montpellier in the south of France. I headed the Art and BGD department of the same University Hospital, and I am President of National University Council in Reproductive Medicine and Medical Gynecology. Uh, uh, my research area, which consists to assessing human oocyte maturation and fertilization by uh, omics approach, and we largely studied endometrium receptivity and the effects of COACH protocols, as well as progesterone on endometrium receptivity. I did publish it over 170 peer-reviewed publication in PubMed and over uh, f um, 60 chapter and nine books. So today, we our Winnie Bar uh, is cool, um, is consisting to to hear that talk uh, about is the progesterone an essential hormonal in uh, luteal phase of uh, frozen embryo transfer cycle. The talk will be delivered by Dr. Elena Laparta. She is a gynecologist specialized in assisted or reductive treatments, and she working in Instituto Valenciano de Infertility Dead, uh, EV groups in Valencia since 2005. She combines clinical practice with research activity, being part of uh, EV Foundation team. Dr. Laparta is professor of master in biotechnology of human assisted of reduction and embryology. She is, uh, she delivers frequently uh, lectures about progesterone in uh, fresh embryo cycle, uh, fresh cycle or frozen embryo cycle. Today, she is, uh, speaking about is progesterone is crucial for hormonal substitutive treatment to support luteal phase in frozen embryo transfer. Please, Elena. Thank you very much, Samir. It's a, um, a honor to be presented by you, in fact, and I am really happy to be here today talking about such an interesting topic for me because I am really uh, fond of uh, this this topic about the luteal phase management and how to control this luteal phase in order to individualize the, the management of our patients in order to increase uh, the chances of pregnancy. Uh, I am going to talk uh, exclusively about uh, frozen embryo transfer cycles or artificial cycles uh, because uh, during the last years my research has been focused on that scenario, as you will see in the next slides. Here are my disclosures. And uh, I will uh, talk about um, artificial cycles because it is a very frequently used method for endometrial preparation. In fact, in frozen endotransfer cycles, uh, around 50% of them are done uh, in artificial cycles. And in egg donation cycles, uh, you can see our statistics in our clinic. We do like 95% uh, of cycles uh, under HRT treatment. Why? Because it is essential for being able to synchronize the donor with the recipient. So uh, taking into account that this is a very frequent protocol for preparing the patients for embryo transfer, it is very important to optimize uh, the, the management of the luteal phase. As all of you know, um, the artificial endometrial preparation cycle consists of giving hormones, sequential hormones, to mimic the ones observed in a natural cycle. So we start with estrogens uh, from the menstruation of the patient, and once the endometrium looks ready and has a trilaminar pattern, uh, we start with the progesterone in order to open the, uh, the luteal phase. 
this uh, support uh, with, uh, is, is usually done with this uh, progesterone that is essential in this scenario because in the artificial cycle, there is uh, no production of endogenous progesterone. So this is why it is essential to treat patients with exogenous progesterone. Uh, if we go to the literature, we see that uh, there are many, many options to, 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 to treat patients with progesterone because uh, there are different ways of administration, uh, for example, vaginal, subcutaneous, intramuscular, oral or rectal. Uh, there are also different doses, and in the data sheet, uh, sometimes we can see the proposed uh, doses uh, in IVF-stimulated cycles, but obviously the, the dose will change according to the scenario in which we have to, to transfer uh, the embryo. It is different a stimulated cycle or a natural cycle uh, in comparison with an artificial cycle in which we don't have endogenous progesterone, and the needing will be higher. And finally, there are two types of progesterone. The natural progesterone, uh, the natural like progesterone that is body identical to the natural molecule of, of progesterone and is the, the most frequently used nowadays. And there is also the possibility of using synthetic uh, progestins such as the dihydrogesterone that has been used for many years for treatment abortion, but it has been proposed in the last years as an alternative uh, for uh, luteal phase support by the oral route. If we want to, to, to know what uh, physicians are really prescribing, uh, it is nice to see the results of this large survey, uh, which included more than uh, 400 IVF units. And you see that the most frequently route of progesterone administration was the vaginal route. In 77% of the cases, uh, clinicians choose uh, vaginal uh, delivery as a sole uh, route of administration, and in 17% they combine it with another route uh, of administration. But we could say, according to the results of this survey, that the vaginal progesterone route is the most frequently used uh, worldwide, but mainly in Europe, because in the U.S. they also use IM more frequently than, than in Europe. But if we go to the literature, we see that the luteal phase support in the different studies are different. And uh, among centers, we see uh, the use of different routes, different doses, and also the length of progesterone exposure is different according to the, to the doctor or to the, to the center. And this, by disintergenating the way of administering progesterone, no monitoring of luteal phase has been routinely performed. And this could be done by measuring serum progesterone levels as a biomarker to know that uh, if the patient is absorbing adequately the uh, exogenous progesterone. But this was not done traditionally because it was known that um, the, the, the serum progesterone levels were very unstable uh, in natural cycles. In fact, you can see that during a whole day, there are uh, significant variations in the concentrations of uh, serum progesterone. So uh, it is very uh, uh, difficult to, to measure progesterone in a natural cycle. But fortunately, in artificial cycles, it has been shown that uh, six hours after the onset of progesterone exposure, we reach a very constant level. So we, we can obtain a steady levels and they maintain quite constant if we maintain the dose throughout the day. So in artificial cycles, we can measure certain progesterone and we are not going to suffer this high variation in serum levels observed in natural cycles. Moreover, uh, same progesterone levels were not measured uh, because we knew the differences in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics between uh, vaginal or IM preparations. For example, uh, as you can see here, the serum progesterone levels when we use vaginal progesterone are significantly lower uh, than when we use intramuscular progesterone. 
But on the contrary, if we go to the uterus, we see that the endometrial tissue levels are significantly higher when using vaginal in comparison with intramuscular. And this is explained because of the uh, because of the of the effect of the of the first uterine pass effect. That means that after a uh, uh, vaginal application of a uh, progesterone tablet, uh, we have a very rapid uh, absorption to the uterus and the levels increase uh, very, very rapid, regardless the levels in the bloodstream. So this is why uh, it was very well stated that the serum concentrations were not correlated with the endometrial transformation of the endometrium or the ability to establish and support a pregnancy. This was uh, published or concluded according to the results that uh, have been published before. But, uh, well, I just wanted to mention this quote that says that fundamental progress has to do with the reinterpretation of ideas and the research continues and uh, in the in the last years we have seen that um, there can be a correlation between serum progesterone levels and what happens in the in the uterus uh, in this study by published by John in, in human reproduction it was seen that um, when using different doses of intramuscular progesterone we could see different serum progesterone levels uh, which in turn uh, modified the endometrial transformation of the endometrium and not only this not only about uh, we are talking about the histological transformation but also the gene expression profile was different uh, according to the different doses of progesterone so perhaps dosing uh, has something to do with the effect in the uterus but most importantly uh, in the last years, uh, in the last five years, uh, it has been published that there, there seems to be a correlation between serum progesterone levels and pregnancy outcomes. So regardless of um, basic science, when we go to the clinical scenario, it is very important to see that when using vaginal progesterone, there is a correlation between serum progesterone levels and pregnancy outcome. Um, this has not been um, analyzed before, uh, before the, the first publication by Jovic, but the truth is that the last uh, manuscripts uh, conclude the same thing. Those patients having low levels of serum progesterone have significantly lower uh, chances of ongoing pregnancy or life birth rate. Of them, um, all are retrospective except for two uh, studies that are prospective and are the ones that we have done or we have conducted in our clinic. The first study uh, was uh, published uh, three years ago in human reproduction and it consisted on uh, including patients undergoing egg donation in order to uh, exclude the, the bias of the embryo quality. All of them were uh, under an HRT treatment and all of them received the same dose of vaginal progesterone, 400 milligrams every 12 hours. Well, we saw that the mean serum progesterone level was 12.7 nanograms per ml, that I have to say that is the usual mean level of progesterone when using vaginal progesterone but the most striking finding was that in those patients having serum progesterone levels on the day of embryo transfer below 9.2 nanograms per ml the ongoing pregnancy rate was significantly lower in fact it was 20 percent lower that this is too much um, obviously, after seeing these results and, and, and being aware that one out of four patients had such a low levels because the, the, the threshold of 9.2 corresponded to the percentile 25, we uh, decided to continue doing research and see if we could validate the same results in the 
general population coming to our clinics for a, a, an embryo transfer in an artificial cycle, not only for egg donation, but also patients using their own eggs and with different characteristics. So uh, we, we, we did a second study. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, show you these results that, uh, that uh, show it that this lower ongoing pregnancy rate of service was also because the clinical pregnancy rate was significantly lower. We also observed a higher biochemical and miscarriage rate, although it was not statistically significant due to the low number of cases um, in, this, in this first study. So after this, uh, this study, we, we um, question ourselves different, quest, uh, different, uh, different things. Okay, the first question was if uh, these results, as I said before, uh, were applicable to the general population. And uh, for this, we designed a much more ambitious study, including, uh, including almost 1,200 uh, patients. Uh, and all of them uh, under HRT cycle and with the same dose of vaginal progesterone, 800 milligrams per day. And once again, we saw the same results. These, these results were presented in ESRE last year and are now under revision for publication. Uh, we saw that once again, uh, the, the, the ongoing pregnancy rate was significantly lower and the clinical miscarriage rate was significantly higher. In this case, the threshold was uh, a little bit different, 8.8 .8 nanograms per male, but very similar to the previous one, that was 9.2. Uh, but uh, but so we could say that this threshold is around 9 nanograms per ml uh, that could be considered the critical uh, threshold. Uh, I can say that after uh, analyzing almost 1,400 patients uh, in artificial cycles, we could define very uh, exactly the critical threshold that is around nine. And the, the positive things of these two studies is that uh, it, they were blinded. I mean, we didn't know the result of progesterone level on the day of embryo transfer until the end of the study. So we didn't manipulate the look at the support in these patients, and we could analyze uh, the real impact of having low levels of progesterone in our patients. Well, the, the second question was if uh, this uh, result is consistent, and we, could, uh, we can say yes, because we have seen that in 80% of patients, uh, the, the level of progesterone is going to be in this, uh, on the same side in a subsequent cycle. So it is something related with the intrinsic characteristics of the patient uh, with the capability of absorbing progesterone because we, uh, we can predict uh, uh, very, very easily if a patient is going to have a low level of progesterone in a, in a subsequent site. Uh, another question is if it is predictable. And uh, we, we, we have seen that uh, we don't need to wait until day five to, to, to measure certain progesterone. We see that on day four after progesterone exposure, we know if patients are uh, in the right um, level of serum progesterone. So in case uh, the doctor wants to manipulate the luteal phase support according to the levels of progesterone, uh, the serum progesterone levels can be measured one day in advance before the embryo transfer, just in case the doctor wants to cancel the embryo transfer because of very extreme low levels. Uh, we have seen also that levels remain quite constant throughout the day. So uh, usually we can see uh, from the beginning, except in some cases, that uh, that the patient is absorbing adequately the levels of progesterone or not. 
Uh, another question is if uh, the effect is the same on the mid and late luteal phase, because we did our studies measuring serum progesterone uh, in the mid luteal phase on the day of embryo transfer after five days of progesterone exposure. But uh, the question is if uh, the levels of progesterone are, are also important later on, not only during the implantation window. We did uh, a study in which we measured serum progesterone four days after embryo transfer, seven days, and 11 days after embryo transfer, uh, the day of the pregnancy test. And as you can see here, uh, those patients ending up with an ongoing pregnancy had uh, mean levels of progesterone higher than those patients uh, who ended up with a miscarriage or with a negative result. And the, and, the, and the area under the cure of progesterone exposure, according to the result, was uh, significantly different between these three groups. Here you can see the, the, the mean and start, a standard deviation of serum progesterone according to the pregnancy outcome. And you see that uh, during the whole luteal phase, from the day of embryo transfer until the day of the pregnancy test, we have lower levels of um, of progesterone. And finally, uh, the, the most important question is if it is corrigible. If we detect that the patient is having low levels of progesterone, can we solve this situation? Well, according to the literature, it was seen that uh, uh, increasing doses of exogenous progesterone uh, can improve the pregnancy outcome. So this is why uh, we question ourselves if these patients having low levels of progesterone uh, receiving the same doses as the other group and who were considered infratreated patients could uh, be improved the results by increasing the serum progesterone levels. So our hypothesis was if increasing the doses of progesterone might increase the serum progesterone levels. The first option was to increase the dose of biennial progesterone, but uh, they were already receiving a, a high dose of progesterone. This could increase the biennial discharge. So uh, we decided to add another way of administration by uh, adding subcutaneous progesterone to these patients with low levels of progesterone from the day of embryo transfer. So uh, we decided to uh, start with subcutaneous progesterone when we detected that the levels of progesterone were low. We have two scenarios. The first one was patients with a previous failed HRT cycle in which serum progesterone was low and they didn't get pregnant. So in that case, we decided uh, in the following cycle to start with subcutaneous progesterone from the beginning of the luteal phase support. So they were receiving our traditional luteal phase support with 400 milligrams every 12 hours and uh, combined it with subcutaneous progesterone. Um, we have uh, 224 patients with low serum progesterone levels in a first embryo uh, transfer. Uh, 150 didn't have a non-wing pregnancy, and of them, uh, we have uh, 20 patients uh, who repeated the embryo transfer, but they didn't uh, um, uh, do the rescue treatment and 89 patients uh, did a rescue treatment with subcutaneous progesterone. Our first finding was that those patients with uh, subcutaneous progesterone added showed a mean uh, level of serum progesterone of 28.8 nanograms per ml, significantly higher than the uh, mean level in the previous cycle, that was 7.1, and this was obviously statistically significant. As you can see here, the levels of progesterone were significantly higher when adding subcutaneous progesterone. And most importantly, the uh, ongoing pregnancy rate 
was significantly improved in those patients having received uh, the rescue treatment with subcutaneous progesterone from the beginning in comparison with those patients uh, not having received this um, extra dose of progesterone. Obviously, uh, these numbers are not so high, but uh, they were uh, very useful to plan the second part of, of this study that consisted on uh, measuring serum progesterone the day of embryo transfer, and if it was low, starting with subcutaneous progesterone from uh, the day of embryo transfer onwards, because obviously many patients do not have the background of a previous cycle uh, with low levels. So we wanted to demonstrate if we could uh, rescue the situation in the same moment of the embryo transfer. If we detected that same progesterone levels were low um, um, and treating with subcutaneous progesterone, we could uh, solve the problem. So in these uh, cases, we decided to start with subcutaneous progesterone or to add subcutaneous progesterone to the vaginal one from the day of embryo transfer instead from the beginning. Well, we have been doing this uh, for the last months and, and we have, uh, well, almost 2,000 patients analyzed. Uh, uh, and, and you can see that uh, once again, 30% of them show low levels of uh, serum progesterone uh, when receiving uh, vaginal progesterone as a luteal phase support. So there is always uh, the same proportion of patients uh, um, having inadequate levels of progesterone when using this route. And uh, in these patients, we started with the rescue two. In this case, we, we say two. That means that we started with subcutaneous progesterone from the day of embryo transfer. And you can see now that the ongoing pregnancy rate in these patients were not significantly different, was absolutely similar to the one observed in patients with good progesterone levels. And the miscarriage rate was also quite similar. So we have similar results in both groups, thanks to uh, the use of this personalization according to serum progesterone. So we can say now, that this rescue strategy two, that means uh, adding subcutaneous progesterone on embryo transfer day, uh, avoids the negative effect of low levels of progesterone. Because uh, in the first two studies in uh, 14,000 uh, patients, we demonstrated before that they always uh, saw 18 to 20 percent less ongoing pregnancy. Uh, right. So this was something that was uh, really um, evident. And the addition of subcutaneous progesterone offers similar results to the with, with higher serum progesterone levels. And uh, here you can see uh, the, the results uh, of ongoing pregnancy rate according to the different percentiles of serum progesterone. And I show you this because I questioned myself if we could rescue this type of patients regardless the levels of progesterone, but we can say yes. I mean, even in those patients with less than 6.5 nanograms per ml on the day of embryo transfer, we uh, could have a 50% of ongoing pregnancy rate once we added uh, the subcutaneous progesterone. So the problem is solved thanks to this personalization. So now the graphs have changed. Uh, we saw traditional this decrease in 18, 20%, and now there, the difference is no longer present thanks to, to this type of treatment. So just to conclude, uh, I, I want to remark that uh, when using vaginal progesterone, that we use it very frequently, uh, we have uh, realized that three out of 10 women show inadequate levels of serum progesterone. And the objective is to identify these infratreated patients in order to uh, treat them adequately to improve their luteal phase support. 
One option is to add other way of progesterone administration, and we have demonstrated uh, that addition of subcutaneous progesterone is effective. Another option is to increase the dose of the same progesterone uh, or change the type of progesterone. We can move to natural to, uh, to synthetic progesterone. This has still to be demonstrated, of course. And finally, we can uh, move to the natural cycle. We don't have to forget this option because uh, there are some patients uh, who are resistant to, to the exogenous progesterone and uh, have better outcome when moving to natural cycles. So obviously, this is only possible when the patient has regular menstrual cycles, but um, it is a, an option to be considered in some uh, difficult cases. So thank you very much. I'm waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, Elena, for this wonderful talk about a very difficult subject. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. First one, is there an association between progesterone level and implantation window? That means, is there a progesterone window during luteal phase and perceive preparing the implantation window? Well, it is, um, we know that uh, if we consider the secretory transformation of the endometrium as a marker of endometrial receptivity, we know that um, even with very low levels of serum progesterone, with 300 uh, milligrams of uh, nanograms per ml of serum progesterone, we can uh, obtain a secretory transformation of the endometrium. But this does not mean that the endometrium is uh, able to, or capable to uh, um, support an implantation and an ongoing pregnancy. Um, moreover, we have tried to elucidate if serum progesterone levels could be related with endometrial implantation uh, timing with the ERA test, and we could not see a correlation between serum progesterone levels and the ERA test. We have seen that ERA test is correlated with uterine endometrial progesterone levels, but not with serum progesterone levels. So we must be talking about two different things. One is the, the timing, and this must be related with the uh, time of progesterone exposure, and the other uh, issue is to talk about uh, serum progesterone levels that need to be uh, very high to maintain the pregnancy. So we are talking about different aspects. One is implantation and the other is maintenance of pregnancy. Another question, is there an extra pelvis effect of progesterone on immunopression, suppression, and consequently, it's sufficient, sufficient level uh, may cause problems, according to you? Well, it is stated that progesterone uh, is essential in the immunomodulation of, of pregnancy. This is something very well known and very well demonstrated in the literature. And obviously, if uh, same progesterone levels are associated not only with implantation, but also with the risk of miscarriage and, and, and the rate of live birth, is because progesterone has another extra uterine effect uh, that, that help to the maintenance of pregnancy, for sure. So another question is, does the problems of placentation is related to the progesterone level as a estradiol in fresh embryo replacement? In this case, should you advise, should we increase the estradiol level? Well, we, we have not analyzed this so far, uh, but in any case, we have compared the risk of having uh, obstetrical and neonatal complications according to the level of progesterone at the moment of the, of the embryo transfer, and we could not see any correlation uh, with this. So we cannot answer this question yet, but for the moment, according to our experience, we have not seen a, a correlation between the same progesterone levels at the moment of implantation and, and later, later problems. 
So another question is, uh, uh, so far there is two models which are available, your with progesterone dosage plus rescue as you perfectly develop in your nice talk. And Kate Devine, who proposing uh, a parent, uh, parenteral uh, root progesterone plus or less vagina progesterone, which aiming to reduce the risk of having low level of progesterone. Why not generalize progesterone parenteral root in frozen embryo transfer uh, in artificial cycle in order to avoid the progesterone dosage which appear imperfect so far? Because as you know, in the literature, as you mentioned, where the rate vary from nine to 20 nanogram ml. Well, this is a very good question. Um, the, the decision making on um, which type of progesterone uh, to use depends on doctors and patients' preferences, of course, but also on the availability of this product in different countries. For example, we don't have in Spain intramuscular progesterone, we have subcutaneous progesterone, and it depends on the country, you will have one or another option. But um, assuming that vaginal root is one of the preferred routes by clinicians, we have to take into consideration that uh, we should measure certain progesterone to detect those patients having inadequate levels and then you can individualize uh, the, the, the needing of uh, giving an extra dose of intramuscular or subcutaneous progesterone in those patients uh, that are with inadequate levels. So if we would give, for example, intramuscular progesterone to all patients, it would be an option, obviously, but if it is given an, an, as an extra dose to the vaginal progesterone, we would be over 70% of population who didn't need an extra dose of uh, IM progesterone from the beginning. So I think that um, obviously the, the decision of giving IM or subcutaneous progesterone uh, depends on the doctor, but uh, in the same way we have to control certain progesterone levels to know if they are correctly treated or not. I have a very uh, recent question. You know, we're talking more of more about vagina microbioma and its uh, impact on success rate. So my question is, do you consider is there relationships between vaginal absorption of uh, 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 progesterone and uh, uh, vaginal microbioma? That means in patient in which we still very we did know it very low uh, progesterone level. Do you consider maybe this phenomena may be impacted by vaginal uh, microbioma? For sure. I think uh, we have not studied this yet, but uh, obviously uh, it is a very important factor to be studied because obviously many factors can affect the vaginal microbioma and among them the hormonal treatments can be can be factors affecting that okay so we don't know if by treating patients with these hormones we are altering the microbioma which in turn will affect the absorption of drugs uh, by the vaginal root because it has been uh, suggested that obviously this um, alteration of the, the microbioma can affect the release of uh, drugs by this by this way. So obviously, uh, we it would be very interesting to analyze the percentage of patients having uh, an, an abnormal microbioma uh, in, in 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 this group with low levels of progesterone because there must be something explaining why, when giving the same dose of progesterone, there can be such a the variability in the in the way of absorbing progesterone, and this could be a very very uh, interesting line of research to know if treating the patients with probiotics or uh, or anything to 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 normalize the microbioma, we we could uh, favor the, the absorption of progesterone. So I have a practical question now. 
how long between the last progesterone administration and the due date? When you giving progesterone and when you performing progesterone assay? Well, we uh, in our first study we were very strict and we we did the the serum progesterone determination like six hours after the last dose of progesterone. Okay, just trying to be um, homogeneous uh, in the population that we were uh, studying. Uh, in the second study that uh, was a much bigger study. Uh, we uh, didn't control this so much because we wanted to see if the duration between last dose, uh, the time frame between last dose of progesterone and blood extraction influenced on the results. And we saw that um, it is true that the longer the duration between last dose of progesterone and uh, blood analysis, the lower levels of progesterone, but this was not statistically significant and clinically relevant because uh, patients didn't have a poorer outcome uh, because of, of, uh, of this. So uh, clinically speaking, this was not uh, very relevant, but obviously uh, it decreases a little bit if, they, if they, the time frame uh, is increasing. So, uh, uh, in frozen embryo transfer, how about the obstetrical and neonatal, uh, neonatal complications between uh, uh, HRT cycle with, and the cycle with corpus luteum, respectively? As you know, there is more macrosomia in frozen embryo transfer comparing with fresh embryo replacement. Do you think this is due to low progesterone or associated to estradiol in fresh cycle? Well, I think that uh, the main concern about HRT cycles nowadays is the risk of preeclampsia that has been suggested to be higher in comparison with natural cycles or even stimulated cycles. And why? Because of the absence of corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum uh, produces uh, the relaxin that has been uh, suggested as one of the molecules related with the high risk of preeclampsia because they couldn't see uh, different uh, levels of progesterone in patients having uh, preeclampsia or not. So it seems that this is not related with the progesterone levels. This is related with the presence of relaxin uh, produced by the corpus luteum. In fact, in, in our study, we um, haven't seen a different risk of preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders during pregnancy related with progesterone levels. We thought that we were going to find something, but no, the, the prevalence was very similar in both groups. My last question is, how about, how do you explain the increasing of birth defect risk with oral dehydroprogesterone? Uh, that means uh, my question relate to current labor. What do you think about? I still don't think about that because, well, this paper has been published, I think, at, uh, at the end of uh, last year, but has been rejected now because uh, the editor-in-chief uh, detected some methodological issues, so they are reviewing that. Uh, it is true that some papers have suggested a higher risk of congenital abnormalities, mainly heart uh, problems, but I think that this is yet to be, to be really demonstrated because uh, there is no yet a real well-designed uh, study demonstrating that. According to the results of the LOTUS 1 and, and 2 studies, they didn't see an increase in, in the congenital malformations, but I think that this has yet to be, to be demonstrated. So for the moment, uh, well, they have seen that uh, the, the, in terms of pregnancy outcome, there is a, a similar result. Um, 
obviously in this case you, you cannot individualize the luteal phase support according to the serum progesterone levels because when you are giving a synthetic progestogen you cannot measure progesterone to, to, to see if, uh, if um, the patient is absorbing or not this medication because we are talking about two different molecules and well, I think that before uh, starting using this, we need uh, more experience on that and to be and to feel safe about uh, the use of this drug because it's a synthetic drug. So uh, we we need uh, more experience on that. Okay. What it is true is that is that natural progesterone has been used for many years worldwide, and we. Uh, feel safe and we, we, we know that there is no risk of uh, congenital abnormalities by using this type of, of uh, medication. Thank you very much, Elena. And as a chairman of your Wibi Bar of, your, of uh, today, I would like to conclude for you our virtual audience about uh, how progesterone is very important in frozen embryo uh, transfer to support luteal phase because I had you you mentioned about progesterone regulates the implantation window, uh, increases endometrium vascularity, and is uh, progesterone is considered as a immunomodulator and reduces uterine contraction during uh, implantation phases. So that means there is absolutely necessary to to measure progesterone level in all patients who are on a frozen embryo cycle with uh, uh, artificial cycle and individualize the luteal phases support based on uh, the result. And second message take home, be, uh, take home is uh, there is a minimum uh, threshold of progesterone value on the day of embryo transfer, which must be reached in the artificial cycle of preparation of endometrium to optimize uh, success, uh, success rate. If the minimum of threshold of progesterone is not adequate, as you mentioned, Elena, there are different options to overcome this problem, uh, switch to another route of uh, progesterone administration or cycle cancellation or switch to natural or stimulated cycle. That means yesterday we are able to individualize those adjustment according to vaginal absorption, uh, absorption and transfer by one day if the threshold is rich. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, if we keeping uh, more attention about frozen embryo transfer in relationships to progesterone level, by this way, honestly, we can uh, expect we can expect it for to achieve very high success success rate of uh, uh, live births. Thank you very much, Elena, and thank you thank you very much for IPSA supporting for this uh, Wibi Bar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samir.